Let's talk about this whole idea of redox. Redox is the combination of the words reduction and oxidation. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. Do these always go together? Yes. If something lost electrons, they have to go somewhere. Something has to become reduced. Why do we call it reduction? Well, sometimes this is confusing. How does something gaining electrons become reduced? When you gain electrons, what happens? It becomes more what? More negative. And when you become more negative, your charge becomes more reduced or more negative. So from this you can see that an atom cannot become oxidized without another atom becoming reduced. These reactions are completely tied together. To help remember what the terms reduction and oxidation mean, sometimes students will use the mnemonic oil rig. Oil means oxidation is loss. Rig means reduction is gain. There are three ways of representing redox reactions which are shown here. This is the same reaction written in all three ways. The reactants are acetaldehyde, NADH, and a proton. The products are ethanol and NAD+. Let's look at option three, where the reactants and products have been broken down into two half reactions. The top reaction here is the reduction half, and the bottom reaction is the oxidation half. We know this because of where the electrons appear in the half reaction. If to form ethanol we need to add two electrons to acetaldehyde, then we know that ethanol is the product of adding two electrons onto acetaldehyde and we know that reduction is gain of electrons. Let's look at the oxidation half reaction. If we look at the before and after, if we removed two electrons from NADH, we produce NAD+. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Therefore, in this reaction, we can say that ethanol is the reduced form, that acetaldehyde is the oxidized form of the carbon compound. NADH is the reduced form, and NAD+, is the oxidized form of this compound. NADH is really important in metabolism. You're going to see this compound over and over again. This is an electron carrier. It moves electrons from one place to another in the cell. So when you see it as a reactant or a product of a reaction, you automatically know that it is a redox reaction. If we didn't have the half reactions, then we could take a look at the structure of the compounds to determine if they were oxidized or reduced. In biology, we deal with a lot of metabolic reactions that oxidize or reduce carbon compounds. In this example, we can see that acetaldehyde has four carbon-hydrogen bonds compared to that of ethanol that has five carbon-hydrogen bonds. We know that electrons can move with hydrogen atoms. So when we compare these two compounds, the one here with more carbon-hydrogen bonds is more reduced than the compound with less carbon-hydrogen bonds. But why did this happen? Why did electrons move from NADH onto acetaldehyde to form ethanol? This is not something that you're going to need to memorize for every single metabolic reaction. There's a tool called a redox tower that we can use to predict the movement of electrons in biological reactions. Here's the basic structure of a redox tower. We have a list here of half reactions and their E value. This value is the reduction potential which is the likeliness of a compound to gain electrons. The organization of the tower shows positive E values at the bottom with negative E values at the top. This means that the compounds at the bottom of the tower are more likely to gain electrons when you compare one of these compounds to one at the top of the tower. You may also notice a slash on each line of the tower. On the left-hand side of the slash is the oxidized form of the compound. The right-hand side is the reduced form of the compound. Let's take a closer look at the electrons moving from one compound to another using the redox tower. Let's combine the two half reactions shown here, hydrogen gas and NAD+. When we combine two half reactions using the redox tower, we can answer several questions about the reaction. We can ask which compound is the electron donor and which is the electron acceptor. Using just the information in the tower, we can see that the NAD half reaction sits below hydrogen gas on the tower, and compounds that sit lower on the tower are more likely to gain electrons. Therefore, the electron donor needs to be either hydrogen gas or the protons. 
From here, you look at either side of the slash, the oxidized form and the reduced form of this compound. The reduced form has electrons. The oxidized form does not. Therefore, hydrogen gas will be the electron donor, and this electron will fall down the tower and reduce NAD plus to form NADH. Let's look at one more reaction. This is an equation often used to represent the many reactions involved in central metabolism. First, let's find our two half reactions. Glucose is here at the top and oxygen is here at the bottom of this tower. Let's ask our questions again. Which compound is the electron donor and which is the electron acceptor? The glucose half reaction is above the oxygen half reaction. Therefore, the reduced compound of the top half reaction will act as our electron donor. So when oxygen here accepts electrons from glucose, which oxygen wants to do, not just because it's at the bottom of the tower, but also because it is below the glucose half reaction, it will become reduced, forming water. There's one more element to redox towers that I want to discuss, and that is using a redox tower to predict the movement of electrons in electron transport chains. Here we're going to use the electron transport chain from photosynthesis. Remember that electron transport chains exist inside of membranes because they are pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane in order to form a gradient. So light is going to hit photosystem 2. This light energy changes form into chemical energy as it excites this electron. The excited electron moves to plastoquinone. This reduces plastoquinone. This means that plastoquinone must sit lower on the redox tower than the excited photosystem 2. The electron now moves from plastoquinone onto cytochrome B. In this transfer step, plastoquinone becomes oxidized and cytochrome B becomes reduced. So with each transfer in an electron transport chain, it is actually a redox reaction. From cytochrome B, the electron moves to cytochrome F, and then finally onto photosystem 1. At this point, the electron is pretty low in energy. The energy has been used to pump protons across the membrane. So now in our story of this electron, photosystem 1 will now need to absorb light energy in order to excite this electron. The light energy will be converted to chemical energy as the electron becomes excited and leaves the photocenter onto ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin will then lose the electron to FNR, and FNR will eventually dump the electron onto NADP to form NADPH. So here's that information written in table form. We start with an unexcited photosystem 2. It absorbs light to form the excited state. Once it absorbs this light, the photosensor now becomes a very powerful electron donor. We know that because the redox potential has become very negative and it sits higher on the redox tower. We can follow the same steps as in our picture on the previous slide all the way down to photosystem 1. You can see that the energy in this electron has greatly diminished once it reaches photosystem 1 because photosystem 1 sits low on the tower in the unexcited state. The compounds that accept low energy electrons sit lower on the tower in general because they have to have a very strong reduction potential to accept electrons when the electron is very low in energy. But that is soon fixed when photosystem 1 absorbs light. Photosystem 1 is now in the excited state and we can follow this electron all the way down to the final electron acceptor, NADP, to form NADPH. We have now followed this electron from the be very beginning of the electron transport chain onto NADPH. But where did this electron come from in the first place? Once we have excited an electron from photosystem 2, it ends up on NADPH. Therefore, photosystem 2 is now in the oxidized state and can no longer absorb light energy to excite an electron. So my question now is what on this tower would be a good donor for photosystem 2? Which compound here can donate an electron? This is a typical test question for this class. Can you, using a redox tower, pick out a good electron donor for photosystem 2? The answer is basically anything that sits above photosystem 2 in the tower. In nature, we know that photosystem 2 has the power to pull electrons off of water, and water sits above photosystem 2 on the tower. Other potential donors on this tower shown here are also possible, but the drop from, say, 
hydrogen gas to photosystem two is relatively large. This use of a drop could be potentially disastrous for the cell, as that energy released um, can form a lot of heat or a little miniature explosion in the cell. So drops are usually kept small, as you can see, by all the steps between each photosystem we have highlighted on this table.